I'd like to start with a little bit of meditation because this work is about entering the mystic, entering the mystical. It's about entering that space beyond language. It's about entering that space beyond, beyond English, beyond German, beyond Hebrew, beyond Krosa. It's about entering that space beyond language. And in that space, we connect with nature. And that's been my journey. And that's been my journey with, with my adopted family, the Cross Nation. And, uh, and that's what I'm sharing with all of you. So I think before we start, just to, we just drop in, just, just have a little bit of meditation. So if you've got your legs crossed, just to open your body. And then I'll do a little bit of singing, a little bit of chanting. So just allow the wind, the wind of nature, allow the wind to enter you. Because I speak a lot about the wind in my book. And what is the wind but the breath, the life force? So just close your eyes for a moment. I know I'm very sexy and you want to keep looking at me, but uh, <laughs> just for a moment, I want you to look inside yourself and connect with your own soul. And keep your body, if you can, open. And just draw the breath in to welcome the mystic inside of you place of mystery, place of not knowing, the place beyond words, and I'll meet you in that place. And I call on you to listen to your heartbeat to feel the resonance of your own heartbeat because when you are connected to your heartbeat then there's no difference between you and me there's no difference between you and the lion there's no difference between you and the leopard so just close your eyes and connect with your own heartbeat for when you are in rhythm with yourself then there's harmony in this world. It kwamus. It kwamu yo 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 te kwamu te kwamu hey 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 John Keith Kelly, and the Lapa Abi Watkins, who could fund this band, who won't be won to, who could no longer turn daza, who could fund this band to, who could come bola, is in Yanya Zabo, sit Kamago. Oh, my one 
my guru. So making contact with your own heartbeats, asking yourself the question of how is nature calling you right now? What is your face before you're born? And what is your face going to be when you die? That is the, that is the question that stirs all of us. So now I was going to call on you just to open your eyes for a moment. And I'm going to get you to stand up. And I'm going to just do a little bit of dancing. Uh, you didn't know you were going to do some dancing, did you? <laughs> and uh, the reason why we're going to do a bit of dancing is because this is, the way we, this is the way we sing, this is the way we pray in South Africa, through dancing. And when you have a sense of this, then you'll have a sense of the rhythm of the book. So the dancing, we're just going to do it for a few minutes just to loosen up. <laughs> so it's just, just like stomping your feet, just like this. Just feel the rhythm. Just keep the pace. Not up and down, just feel the rhythm. Feel, listen to my rhythm. Just take it easy, relax. And if you have your shoes on, should you take your shoes off. It's so hot out there. So just feel that pulse. Oh, you guys are really going for it, eh? <laughs> I suppose I am in London. So just feel that pulse for your feet. So your feet will go one, two, one, two, one, two. So we'll just do this for a few minutes, then I'll talk to you about the book. How about that? Okay. So here we go. Just look at your feet, left and right. Feel your bones. So you're just sinking into the ground. And then... And then we do a little bit of chanting. And that chanting is the way for us to connect with the divine from Southern Africa. So the chant that I'm using today is going to be the chant of the wind, which is moya, which also means spirit. So we can just do that together. Moya, moya, ya. <laughs> I don't think this is working. Let's try another one. How about mama? Can you guys do mama? Say mama. 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 Oh mama. Oh mama mama. Oh mama mama. And the what can stop? Mama mama. Mama mama. <laughs> Okay, so we're just going to do this for a few minutes. The reason why I'm doing this is just so that you get attuned to what I'm going to talk to you about. Because if I just talk to you, it's just, just words. And there's a lot of noise out there. And I'm trying to bring you beyond the noise to the wind of Africa. And the best way is through a little bit of rhythm, a little bit of chanting. So, mama, go mama. Oh mama. Oh mama, mama. Okay, so we're going to relax the cheeks. So also, you're going to bring your head down and just shake your head like this. And then other sets of cheeks, which can be very tight, especially in the, in the Western world, which is here. You're going to relax these cheeks. And that's why we dance. So just shake your butt a bit. Just go like this. Yeah? Because whole, of, whole Africa rests on, on the hips of the African woman. Okay, so just... Relax. Go like that a little bit more. Yeah? Okay. And then we got, here we go. Oh, mama, mama. Oh, mama, 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 mama. Oh, mama, 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 mama. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Okay, you feeling relaxed now? Are you gonna raise your arms up? Shake your arms. Shake your butt. Okay, I can take a seat. Okay, so. I just want to speak to you about, the, about, about my book, Leopard Warrior. 
So um, I, I wrote this book because I wanted to share a miracle that I experienced in South Africa. And that miracle was how a white, middle-class, privileged boy could become an African medicine man. And I was brought up in a war zone in South Africa. And let me tell you, it was horrendous. It was really, really bad. So I wanted to share the story of how this young, white, middle-class guy could become an African medicine man, a leopard warrior. Bobuntu, which means the depth of humanity. So my story started before I was born, like a lot of shamans, like a lot of Sangomas. It started with my mother in Dublin and her dreams about Africa. And one day she was walking the pier in Dunleary in Dublin and she had a vision of all these elephants coming to her. Now if you know my mother, you know this is quite an, ex this is quite an extraordinary thing because she's not hippie at all, you know. She, was a, she followed her in the corporate world. And uh, she had these visions a number of times and then she felt that she needed to go to Africa and work with African elephants, with the wild ones while they were still there in Africa, while she still could. So she left in the 1950s and 1960s and then she met my father in, in Rhodesia, in Zimbabwe and, um, and she encouraged my dad to go into the bushveld to observe the elephants. And it was quite strange, my father had never been to see elephants in the wild, he'd only seen them in the zoo. But she was an attractive Dublin woman, sure who wouldn't follow her into the bush felt. <laughs> so she dragged him into the bush to look at elephants and that became their church. That became their, their medicine. And, and then when I was born, I was born with this white clay around my eyes and so my mother exclaimed as I came out of the womb, Ah, oh, he looks like a little abbo! In her lovely Dublin accents. And the white doctor frowned at her because it was apartheid, it was the 1970s. And the Kosa nurses ululated, and my father smiled. And years later, my mother forgot that experience until years later, my teacher, Mam Gwevu, my Kosa mentor, came to visit my parents. And as she walked through the gates of my home, my, my mother had this, this recollection of my birth. And she sat my teacher down and she said, Mama, Mam Gwevu, she said, yeah. And through the translator, she described to my teacher my birth. And, and my teacher said, yeah, of course. I was born like that as well, with a white clay around my eyes, just like I have now. And, uh, and she said, all Sangormas who are meant to be Sangormas are born like this. This is John's destiny. So my story is about this incredible experience of, of someone from my background becoming a, a traditional medicine man, a traditional shaman of the Kosa Nation. Um, and the Kosa Nation, is, as many people know, is the nation of Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. But my story is, is even bigger than that. My story is about war. It's about mysticism in terms of finding the mystery inside of us and transformation. And my story is about Ubuntu. It's about humanity. Because I was born in this crucible of, of hatred. And I was born into three wars. And I speak about the three wars in the 70s. My mother comes from, like I say, from Dublin. And she, through the 70s, she'd be on the phone to our family in Belfast. And there was a war on in Belfast. And I was very aware of that. And then there was a second war in my family, and that was in Rhodesia, the Bush War. And it was a horrendous war, the Bush War. And my father comes from Rhodesia, from Zimbabwe. And my uncle was on the War Council. He was a senior military officer in the war in Rhodesia. So as I was growing up, I was aware of these two wars, and of course the third war, which was apartheid, the civil war in South Africa. And I remember one of my earliest memories at the age of five going to Belfast and walking the streets of Belfast and then going to a shop. And it was just an ordinary shop. And at the entrance to the shop, there was the soldier standing there with an M16 rifle. 
And I remember pulling my mother's dress and saying, Mommy, Mommy. And she said, Yes, my boy, yes. And I'm like, Mommy, Mommy. She said, Yes, yes, yes. What, what? And I said, and I pointed to the soldier and I said, Mommy, it's just like back home. <laughs> and um, so that's what I was familiar with. And then going to Rhodesia, going to Zimbabwe, I remembered the army trucks and I remembered all the animals that had been killed to feed the soldiers. And I remembered running on the beach in Cape Town, beneath Table Mountain at the age of eight, trying to keep up with my, with my uncle, who was a colonel and on the war council. And I could feel his energy, I could feel his sadness. And all I was trying to do was to keep up with him as I was running. And I could feel this incredible tenacity inside of him, but also great sadness. So as I was growing up, all I wanted to do was find a way to put an end to this war that I was experiencing outside myself in my reality. And then I found an answer. At the age of 16, I had this very profound dream. And I write about it here. And that dream, which was going to propel me from this middle-class, privileged kid into a medicine man. And what that dream was, was I was in South America, and, um, and I was walking around South America, and I was looking for gold. And then finally, I remember finding the gold. And as I woke up from the dream, there was this woman's voice, and she said to me, in order for you to, in order for you to connect with, with your destiny, you have to experience death. And at that stage, I was about to be conscripted into the South African military and there was a war going on in Angola. So I decided to go into the medical corps because then I was going to become an operational medic and go to the front lines. And I didn't want to be involved in killing. I wanted to be involved with healing, especially after that dream at the age of 16. So then from 18, I was conscripted into the South African military. And my first experience, which I'm going to share with you now, my first experience was helping to rehabilitate soldiers, Special Forces soldiers. And they were some of the world's best fighting, fighting men because we, they'd come from such an extreme situation in Angola where the war lasted for 10 years. So it was equivalent of our Vietnam. So I was in charge of Ward 13, this rehabilitation ward. And if you know apartheid, you know that everything was segregated, black and white, black and white. But fortunately, in the military, there was a lot more togetherness between the various races because you can't have too much separation when men are fighting together. Isn't that the weirdest thing? If, if there's separation between men fighting together, you can forget about it. The war is over before you even pick up a rifle. So the only thing I saw in terms of separation was that there were different different rooms. So the rooms for the white guys, the rooms for the black guys, but it was the same ward and everyone was given equal treatment. And for some reason, I don't know why, but every day I used to go into the, to the black guys ward and I used to ask them if they had any good dreams. Now, I don't know why I did that. There was just something intuitive maybe, I'm not sure. And I had this deep love for these guys because I didn't really understand African spirituality because I wasn't educated with it and I certainly didn't understand apartheid and all I wanted was to feel a sense of peace between the different races in South Africa. So every day I used to go into the ward and I used to say to the guys, good morning guys, did you have any good dreams? And every day there was the stillness and I did this for three consecutive days and I'd open the curtains and She's up against a lot here in London, aren't I? <laughs> so I'd open the curtains and I would, the sun would come streaming in from Pretoria and, and I would say again, good morning guys, did you have any good dreams? And I did this for three consecutive days and on the third day I did the same thing. Good morning guys, did you have any good dreams? And then there was the stillness and silence in the ward. No one said a word. And then there was a sergeant at the back of the room who shouted to me, Sergeant in Lohu, and he said to me, Medic, come over here, Medic, I want to speak to you. 
So then I went over to his bedside and I said to him, Yes, Sergeant, sir, how can I help you, Sergeant? And he said, Medic, in my culture, dreams are very sacred. When I dream, my ancestors show me who's going to die in my platoon and who's going to live. Some of my men laugh at me, but they still die. In my culture, dreams are very sacred. Please don't ask me again whether I've had any good dreams. I said, yes, Sergeant, sir. Thank you, sir. That was my first, that was my first Sangoma teaching at the age of 18. And this man, Sergeant Nlovu, Sergeant Nlovu was becoming a Sangoma. He was becoming a traditional African shaman. And three months after that experience and that teaching, I started my own calling to become a Sangoma. And it came with these spirits of nature, and what I saw is this witch doctor beckoning me to the other world. And he said to me, I can train you to become a, a, a Sangoma like myself, but in order for me to train you, he said in the dream, you're going to become very sick, and you're going to become close to death, because this is the way of my people. Now this was a very, very clear dream, and I just lost one of my patients. One of my patients died of a period of six weeks, and I felt his pulse every day for six weeks, leaving and getting fainter. My patient was only 21 years old, and his mother asked me every day if he was going to live or die. So after that experience, I started Zen meditation, and I asked these questions of why am I alive and why is there suffering? Because I'd experienced such extreme suffering in the South African military. And then after this retreat, a Zen retreat, I received this dream, which I call the witch doctor dream, because I never knew what Sangormas were. And this witch doctor or the Sangorma said to me, I can train you, but in order for me to train you, you're going to come close to death because this is the way of my people. And I said to him, train me, because my life is over now. I've experienced so much death, and I recently had to put my own dog down, and she was one of the closest things to me. So he kept quiet, and then he showed me this vision of the future, and everything came to pass five years' time. And when I woke up from the dream, I had all these boils over my legs, and it was very mysterious and very strange. And I was happy because I knew that the witch doctor from my dream had accepted to train me. And then I went to the military, I went to the hospital, and I was diagnosed with tick bite fever. And then for the next seven years, I had one illness after the next, after the next, after the next. And I was being taught in the spirit world, but what I really needed to do was to find a teacher because I had contracted the dreaded Twaza illness. The Tuazi illness in Southern Africa is a, is a particular illness which people get and it's called the calling illness and in international language we call it the international, we call it the shamanic illness. The illness that is the illness of calling for someone to become a traditional shaman. So a traditional shaman, and I know the word is used a lot here in the Western world, a traditional shaman gets a calling through extreme illness and extreme pain and this is what shatters their ego. And part of my story was to talk about what it's like to be called to become a Sangoma or to become a shaman. And that it's not glamorous. It's extremely painful. And you get to feel deeply. And as you feel deeply, you become terribly haunted by the feelings and pain of the world around you. And the training, the training is about helping to balance your spirit with the world. So my first training was was um, was going to South Korea and becoming a, a Zen student because I couldn't find my teacher. I couldn't find my Sangoma teacher because being a white boy, I was not allowed into the township. I was not allowed to mix and mingle with African people. It was against the law. So for me to go into the township and find a teacher in the late or early 90s, 
I would have got arrested. So my first experience of dealing with this illness was through Zen and Zen Buddhism. So I worked with a teacher in South Korea, um, and I speak about him, Zen Master Subong. But finally, when I met my teacher, after experiencing the illness for seven years, it was a wonderful experience for me. And the night before I met her, she had this profound dream. And in that dream, the Great Spirit came to her and said to her that you're going to train someone from another culture to become a senior Sangoma like you, and that you need to prepare yourself for this. So the next day when I walked through her gate, she looked at me and she said to me, I was the one that she had to train. And then when we sat down and she did the divination, where she went into trance and she called in her ancestors, she saw the last seven years of my life and she said, you almost died from the twaza. An kosiyam kosiyam di kolka kulu. She said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She said, you almost died from this twice illness. What took you so long to come to me? And I said to her, apartheid. Apartheid. And she said, Nkosiyam, Nkosiyam, we almost lost you. And a tear moved down her face, and a tear moved down my face. And in that moment, we connected in spirit. And she said to me, do you want to become my apprentice? Do you want to become a Sangoma? And I said, I don't know what a Sangoma is. And she said, a Sangoma is someone who connects with the spirit world, connects with the ancestors, and then they work through you, and then you can heal people in many different ways. And she said, and also you're going to stop being so sick, the Twaza illness is going to get better. So I said to her, okay, I accept, I'll be your apprentice. And she said, ah, oh, okay, come back tomorrow and I'll give you your first white beads. So the next day she gave me my first white beads. And then I was her apprentice for the last, for the next 10 years. So I talk about that apprenticeship and I talk about what does it mean to become a Sangoma and how we connect with the spirits of the bush, how we connect with the Izanyanya, the spirits of nature how we connect with our amatambo, with our bones, and what does it mean for the modern person, and how can all of you do the same thing? How can you all connect with your ancestors, with the nature spirits? Because if you don't, there's no future for any of us. So my work is about helping to rewild the modern man and woman, so we can all meet in that place where nature touches all of us, where the wind of Africa and the wind of Europe come together and touch us. So I'm just going to stop at that point and then I'm going to read a bit from my book and if there's any questions, or if there's any questions now, do you have any questions before I read from my book? I have a question, but can we read the book first? Shall I read from the book first? Does everyone want me to read from the book? Yeah. So I'm going to transport you to a scene in my training and um, I wrote this as a way to bring the reader, bring all of you on this journey, a journey to South Africa, a journey of initiation, so you can feel the spirit of it as I experienced it. And we are all limited by words, words is a construct, and my my challenge in writing this was to try and create the feeling, like painting a picture. So it's a bit like, like art. So here we go. So this section is in the section I've written towards the end during my initiation period, and I've entitled it Nature as Divination. Tracking nature, tracking spirit. The sun crested the horizon as mist rose from the wet road, creating a mysterious haze. The countryside around us consisted of thick bush and dispersed with open grassland. Occasionally, Mangwevu pointed to a plant and mentioned its qualities. As we descended a steep ravine, a troop of baboons crossed the road. We all shouted, Kamagu! 
and honored and praised our ancestors. The baboon, Mfene and Isikrosa, is one of my animal spirits, Isilos, something I discovered after a number of mysterious dreams and physical encounters. Many Sangomas have baboon Isilo. This animal is one of the guardians of the plant world, and when they come to us in a dream, it is considered very lucky. They are the old men of the bushveld that depart the intuitive wisdom to us Sangwamas so we can maintain the balance between the natural world and man. A large alpha baboon stood guard over the troop. My friends laughed and pointed at it as they felt it represented me and my upcoming ceremony, a lucky omen. We rounded another bend and roared, Gamagu! This time a troop of monkeys, renowned as an Isilo of the Nguevu clan, was crossing the road. This was a sign that the Nguevu ancestors were with us. Our animal totems help open the road for us, enabling us to fulfill our life purpose. They are a sign from our ancestral spirits that we are not alone, and our lives are blessed and supported by them. The physical road we were traveling represented our spiritual road, and our earlier prayers had primed the ancestors to direct and guide us. These signs of nature were also indications of how the ancestors wanted me to use my Sangwama gifts in the world. We arrived at the sea as the sun broke through the clouds and spread its inviting rays across the ocean surface. Mamguevu stormed toward the sea like a general leading her troops into battle. The ancestors were waiting and she was anxious to start her prayers before the sun climbed any higher. I grabbed her ceremonial sticks and ran after her. We all uh, greeted the ducks flying overhead with Tamagu and waited for Mamguevu to open the morning prayers. The water lapped gently at our feet as our white garments flapped in the wind. It was cold. We watched the sea for signs. Then Mama began shouting and the roaring sea and whistling wind. I honor and praise you old people. I honor and praise my ancestors. I honor and praise the great spirit. I honor and praise the great dreamer who's connected to all of us. When she paused, we all responded to her prayers with Tamagu. Mama made offerings of tobacco, rose petals, and an assortment of herbs to the sea. As Mangwevu prayed and chanted, the sea seemed to rise up and take on a life of its own. It became a living, breathing creature with the power to grant our wishes or take our lives. We stepped gingerly on the cloak of her white foam with a sense of trepidation and excitement. So Mam Gwevu opened her heart and prayed like her life depended on it. She prayed to her ancestors, the great spirit Utiko and the spirits of the sea, Abantu Bamlambo. She asked them to bless her family and bless my Sangoma Omguduso ceremony. She scattered white and turquoise beads into the waves while chanting her prayers in a quick staccato fashion. The sea responded by moving closer to her, drenched above her knees. Apprentices rushed to her side, holding her elbows from both sides and pulling her back from the sea. But she was in another world, and the fingers of the sea were drawing her closer. Another wave rushed toward her as she finished her prayers. At the same time, the elder men and Sangormas started talking and pointing to the horizon. In a reef out to sea, there appeared a carriage of light that moved across the water. Tata pointed and whispered, Abantu bomlambo, bapendula tina. The spirits from the sea have answered our prayers. We all screamed, Amagu. Then nature herself began talking to us from the earth, wind and sea. Flocks of ducks and seagulls called in their flight above us, Ay kiki, ay kiki, ay kiki. And we replied, Tamagu, Tamagu. 
The sea crept towards us with a rhythm of its own, and whirlpools of water appeared beside us. All around us on the wet sand we suddenly saw sea snails that had burrowed and crawled in their language of spirals, and we all shouted our joy and love at being heard by the ancient ones. Kamaku, kamaku. More. There's lots more. And sure, you can, you can buy the book and read the rest. <laughs> so, um, on, that, on that note, do any of you have any, any interesting questions, or even boring questions? I don't mind. Sometimes boring questions are interesting for me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The question I had is um, that uh, we hear a lot about African witchcraft. Um, yeah. Um, obviously, it's very interesting, positive, the way you presented it there. Yeah. Um, but we hear some bad things, like, for example, about albinos and uh, the yeah. being uh, persecuted uh, in, in those traditions. Yeah. And we also, you know, those of us who follow those type of traditions um, in Britain yeah. have also um, have negative propaganda. So I just wondered yeah. if there was any truth behind that or what the actual true story is. So part of me writing this book was actually to talk about the true Sangoma and what the tradition is about, because sadly, due to colonialism, Sangomas have been demonized and stereotyped and scapegoated for the last 500 years. And it's actually resulted in huge poverty amongst the Sangomas, and it's actually threatening the actual fabric of the Sangoma culture. And during the time of me being apprenticed, I lost about six close Sangoma colleagues due to poverty. And as I went back from South Africa, I mean, went back from England or overseas, I went to the graveside of my friends. All I could do was put flowers in their graves. And this year, I buried two of my Sangoma colleagues, one of whom was 14 years old, and the other was 70, he was an elder. And all I could do was watch their coffins go into the ground. And the next thing, the elders chose me to become a spokesman to give the true impression of what Sangomas are. So let me be clear with you. If someone practices black magic, they are not, and I repeat, they are not a Sangoma. A Sangoma is a healer. A Sangoma is someone who helps to raise the spiritual energy of the community. So yes, you're going to hear about lots of things in the media. And I've had a lot of issues with the media, in particular in South Africa. And I've spoken to a lot of journalists and I've shouted at them. But there's nothing I can do because, as you all know, sensationalism is what sells the news. Does it mean the news is true? Good luck if you think the news is true. But from my side, as a Sangoma from South Africa, we are healers. And our job is to heal people. And I am doing my best around the world to try and clear up this negative stereotyping. I'm one guy but there's thousands of Sangomas behind me. And the reason why we have survived for thousands of years is because we are connected to nature. Is nature evil? I'll ask you that question. Our job, your job and my job, is to go beyond judgment, to go beyond good and bad, to connect with the force of nature. And that's the world of the Sangoma, and that's what I write about. So everyone has a choice. You can believe in the prejudice, you can believe in the judgments about Africa, but that's not the truth. So I've done my best to write my experience. Whether you believe it or not is up to you, but I've done my best to write this experience. I hope that helps. <laughs> no, I'm pleased you're, I'm, I'm not having a go at you, but I'm pleased you, you're asking the question because often, a lot of people are afraid of Africa. They're afraid of African spirituality because of what you just said. And part of me writing is actually to demystify this and actually talk about the white elephant in the room and say, let's, let's talk about this. So I was trained by the old people as the only white guy in the whole community. And they treated me with the most incredible love and dignity. And they encouraged me to bring the message of the people to Europe. And that's why I was given the name of Tsingolandava, which means the messenger, the one who joins people and connects over long distances. And it breaks my heart each time I go to a funeral and I watch one of my community members dying of poverty. 
it absolutely smashes me to pieces. But there's not much I can do. The only thing I can do is work as a messenger and clear up this negative stereotype. But I can say to you this, yes, there is black magic, but it's not being, it's not being um, organized by Sangomas because we are healers. But if we're going to talk about black magic, then I'd like to speak about how people put curses on one another. What happens here in Europe? What happens in the Western world? Where there's lies and there's untruths and people speak negatively about one another. Is that not black magic? But I'm going to leave it at that note. Because rather than pointing fingers at Africa, I encourage all of us as one human family to start dealing with the shadow, with negativity, and stop projecting it on other people. Because I was brought up in apartheid, and that's what happened. It was the results of people projecting everything onto black people, and it was completely wrong. We all know that. And it carries on being played around the world through people judging African spirituality. Hello, yeah? So what did I get from experiencing war? I found humanity. And, you know, here in the Western world, there's lots of beautiful spiritual this and spiritual that. But let me tell you something. Unless people connect with the shadow inside of themselves, all spirituality means nothing. It means nothing. Nothing! As you have judgment for the person next to you, and you don't work through the judgment, you can be the best Hare Krishna, or the best Christian, or the best Muslim, or the best Jewish person. But that war between people will continue. So, yoga, they talk about the lotus flower. And did you know that the lotus flower feeds off the mud? It feeds off the smelly mud. And when the time is right, that lotus flower blossoms. So that's a beautiful metaphor for the human journey, human spiritual journey, that each of us is called to examine the shadow inside of us, exam examine the judgment and part of it is also examining the wounds, your own pain. So when I'm doing a workshop, I will say to the whole group of people, what is your pain? You don't have to tell me, but I want you to feel your pain. I want you to feel your sadness. I want you to feel your loneliness. Don't give me the love and light because I'll see it inside of you and I'll see the shadow. And I don't want to hear the love and light. I want to hear your pain. I want to hear your loneliness. Because that is what life is calling you to balance, your pain, your wounds. And there's a great mystic called the prophet. And he said the cracks inside of us, those wounds inside of us, are the very thing that help us to connect to God. So these wounds, these wars inside of us, these shadow places, once we breathe into it, we have an opportunity to become mystics, to really be touch something holy. So when I was 18 and I saw these soldiers, these special forces soldiers who were so vulnerable and some of the world's best fighting men, when I saw their vulnerability and they were lying in the, in the hospital, I felt such compassion for them. And in that place, that's how we became friends. So part of the story is a call for each person to examine their wounds examine their shadows because in the essence that's what spirituality is all about and I don't care if you go about it through the Buddhist ways or the Muslim ways it doesn't matter but if you don't examine your wounds the war around us and outside us is just going to continue so I love that thank you war great yeah um, one, one more question um, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, sorry. 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 do you have any connection with Credo Mutua? yes I wrote about him here oh, wonderful. yeah he's in the book and Credo Mutua gave me the name In Lu Yangwe, right. which means House of the Leopard, right. because he recognized me bringing sacred medicine from Africa to the West. So anyway, thanks. Yeah. Uh, with that, thank you, Jan. Thanks, sir.